Chi-Hua Chen from Kleiner Perkins Confield and Buyers joined them in 2007. At Kleiner, Chi-Hua focuses on investments in the iFund and their mobile applications, consumer internet, and the digital media infrastructure. As a board director or observer, he works closely with the teams at Booyah, Chegg, Lockeries, Reputation Defender, and Working Equity. And prior to joining Kleiner, Chiwa worked with Excel Partners as a venture advisor and associate focusing on software as a service, consumer internet, and online advertising. Uh, he originated their investments in Facebook and AdInsend, while also working on the investments in AdMob, BitTorrent, uh, FB Fund, Glam, Trulia, and Yumi Networks. Previously, he was director of marketing at Core Metrics, where he led marketing and inside sales, and he also served as the company's interim CFO through two rounds of venture funding. Chiwa's prior roles include corporate development at Google, business development at eCoverage, and investment banking with Morgan Stanley's technology group. But more importantly, for all of you at Stanford here, he's the world's best overachiever with four degrees from Stanford. And... Uh, <laughs> uh, that's, what it that's the minimum feature set to join Kleiner Perkins, I guess. Um, but with that, I'll let Chiwa introduce uh, Dan. And so, Chiwa, all yours. Thanks, Steve. It's, it's a real privilege to be here today. Um, I fell in love with startups from an ETL seat here in the uh, mid to late 90s. And also, it's, it's a real privilege to be here interviewing my friend Dan Rosenzweig, an entrepreneurial Please leader. Please read my resume compared to yours. <laughs> uh, a, a, an entrepreneurial leader who I've admired for a, a long time and somebody who I get to work with uh, as an investor in Chegg. So since Dan is far more famous than I am, I'll do a quick bio because you guys probably already know him. Uh, an incredible career in traditional and digital media. Uh, by the age of 31, Dan was the publisher of PC Magazine, one of the most important uh, magazines in the area where, era where they actually printed stuff. Um, by 36, he had spun ZDNet out of Ziff Davis and taken it public on the NASDAQ. By 40, he was the COO of the most powerful internet company on the planet, Yahoo. And he found time to run Guitar Hero and do private equity investing in between. And now he's running Chegg, a company that has saved college students... How much money? A quarter of a billion dollars. $250 million and made education affordable to college students. So, Except if I asked, how many of you rented your textbooks this semester versus bought them? Anybody here rent them? You're all too wealthy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Folks over there, those were my hands. Those are my people. So, um, Dan, let's start with a retrospective on, on the Internet, where we've been and where we might be headed. Um, the web browser first came out. 1995, uh, summer before I came to Stanford, I remember coding up a website and competing with my friends to see who could get the most hits. And then uh, the uh, re residential com computer coordinator broke into my room and shut down my computer because it brought down the internet on West Campus when I wrote a hit counter. Um, wh when, did, when did you first see the internet and when did you know that it was going to transform media? So l let me start by, first of all, thanking you all for inviting me. Um, uh, I'm ecstatic to be here, and, and uh, if anything that I've done or says is valuable to you, I'm excited about that. Um, and if anybody of you are looking for jobs, we're hiring. <laughs> um, and my uh, HR coordinator told me to say that. Um, but, but honestly, I, I'm, a, I'm a born and bred New Yorker. I moved to California in 2002 when I was 40 years old um, at the start of my current midlife crisis. And, um, and have really fallen in love with Silicon Valley and fallen in love with the kinds of people that come here and fallen in love with um, the people that back it and the kinds of kids that go to school here because um, I grew up in a very in an environment where you sort of followed the rules, uh, very hierarchical. You work X number of years. You worked a long time at a company. I spent 18 years at Ziff Davis. The thought that in, you guys will have on average six jobs in that 18 years. Um, but I you know, went to high school, went to college, got married, had kids, had the same job, just kept working up, because that's the only way to work up the hierarchy, whereas you come out here and it's a complete meritocracy, and which is anybody from anywhere in the world with a great idea, um, if they can sell that idea to somebody like Chihua, um, you have a chance to go for it. And that is an unbelievable experience and something that I think people who live out here and maybe of your generation take for granted. Um, because when I 
when I was starting and, and talking about what you're talking about, there was really no such thing as a public company uh, in technology. There was really no such thing as equity. Um, uh, all the venture capitalists they invented in, in the semiconductor companies and the PC companies, not even that many PC companies. I don't think companies like Dell, Gateway, the companies at the time ever had seed money uh, as an example. And so I, I grew up um, in the computer magazine business, and as Chiwa said, uh, when I ran PC Magazine, at that point, PC Magazine was the largest computer magazine on the planet, and it reached a grand total of a million people every two weeks. And so we were the voice of, the coverage of, the, the kingmaker of what went on in the computer industry. And somewhere, uh, I got the job in 1994, which was probably about the worst time on the planet to do it. We had just sold to a private equity company. The Ziffs had sold to a private equity company, and I didn't even know what one was. Um, and, uh, and since I now know this is being filmed, I won't describe the experience, except to say um, that the, uh, they came in and they said, look, uh, here's the deal. Uh, management can buy into this deal, and, um, and I'm not changing any terms because I own the company. Thank you. And he walked out. Okay, so I, of course, didn't have very much money because there was no such thing as equity, and I borrowed um, $175,000 to um, buy, be able to buy the equity uh, in the company. And thank God, a company like SoftBank came along and bought the company, Ziff Davis from Forsman Little, uh, 12 months later. And it was the first time I understood the difference between making a salary and accumulating wealth. Because in, in literally in a year, I had... Uh, earned enough money to be able to pay for my kids to go to college, and that was really what I thought the objective was. But it was right around that time um, that we discovered the Internet. So uh, I worked for a company called Ziff Davis. We had a really tremendous leadership team, and the leadership team, we were beginning to realize that there really wasn't much going on in software development anymore. There was no more going on in hardware development, and so we were thinking, what the hell are we going to do with these computer magazines if the coolest thing to cover was annually what was the next printer coming out? because Microsoft had sort of dominated the software scene. A lot of these companies went out of business. And, um, and this guy from uh, uh, Japan, a guy named uh, Masayoshi son of SoftBank, uh, came a-calling, and he bought Ziff Davis, and he wanted to launch 1,000 magazines. And then uh, my old boss, Eric Hippo, said, well, wait a minute, there's this really cool company in California that we've discovered. Uh, it's called Yahoo, and you should meet these guys. And when we were owned by Forsman Little, Yahoo wanted a $10 million investment, and Forsman Little said, look, the last company I owned before I, before I bought you guys was a candle-making company. So I, it's hard enough for me to figure out what you cover, let alone this thing called the Internet, and why would I ever put any of our money in something called Yahoo? And, um, and so this was around 1994, 1995. Um, and then when we got flipped to SoftBank, the same pitch was made. Uh, Eric made this pitch to Masa, and he went out and visited Jerry and David, as you know, who are uh, phenomenal alumni of this amazing institution. And Masa said, I'm not going to give you $10 million. I'm going to give you $100 million. Jerry and David said, we don't need $100 million, and we don't want to be that diluted. And Masa said, you could always use the money. Just tenfold your valuation. So after he invested $100 million, since he now owned us, he came back. He said, you need to make me my money on this thing. And that was the year I learned about the Internet. Um, so we met Jerry and David, and we launched a magazine called Yahoo Internet Life, and it was sort of antithetical at the time to launch a print magazine about the Internet. But back then, no one had ever heard of the Internet. There was no Internet. And so people needed to understand what was the Internet, what were websites. Um, you know, we take for granted that, and we'll talk a, a little bit about that later, the generation you grew up in versus what came before. Uh, but um, So we learned about that, and I met with uh, uh, Jerry and David and a guy named Jeff Mallett, and they came to New York, and they were these sort of young punks at the time because we thought we were cool because we were a magazine publishing company. And, you know, they came in, and they sat down, and I thought I did a brilliant negotiation for one billion impressions on Yahoo to promote Yahoo Internet Life magazine. And uh, six months later, they came into the office, and it turned out that I was now the punk. Yahoo just exploded. And so I fell in love with the Internet ever since that day, and it was very clear to me that print had uh, reached the end of its life cycle in 1996, 1997, um, because we were computer magazines, so the first people to go on the Internet were computer geeks. So you can already begin to see our circulation decline. You can see ZDNet, which is the website I ultimately spun out as if Davis, grow to be, at that point, the eighth largest website in the world behind Yahoo and eBay uh, and companies like that. And it became very evident to me that 
the world um, was about to see a change that I don't think anybody in my generation had ever experienced before. So fast forward to 2002. The bubble pops. The internet is dead. Everyone thinks game over. I'm broke. You're broke. <laughs> and they come calling again, and they recruit you to go run Yahoo. Yes. What was that like? Well, um, as a born and bred New Yorker, I had no interest in moving out to California. And, um, and Jerry Yang knew that. Jerry, it turned out, because of that relationship, uh, the executives from Ziff Davis were on Yahoo's board. Masa was on Yahoo's board. And then uh, Jerry reciprocated, and he sat on the joint board of ZDNet and Ziff Davis. So we became very good friends, and he became a, um, a younger but more valuable mentor to me because he really did understand what was going on, and we were just learning it at the time. And you all grew up with the Internet, right? You've never known a day without the Internet. You've never known a day without broadband. You've never known a day, it feels like, without your iPhones. You've never known a day without uh, YouTube. Um, you know, your generation, this is what you take for granted. Um, my generation back then, I, I was at the beginning of when email came, and it was something called MCI mail. And I remember I, I signed up for it, and I got 14 messages in one day, and I'm like, shit, how am I going to keep up with this? <laughs> um, got 14 messages, got a fax machine and voicemail all at the same time. I'm like, oh, my God, working sucks. Um, and, and so that was at the beginning of all this stuff. So I, I had no interest in moving to California, and I met Terry Semmel, who um, I absolutely fell in love with at the time and, and changed my life, as did Jerry. Um, and they came a-calling, and basically the pitch was, do you want to be an 80-year-old Jewish guy sitting at your house in Scarsdale saying, what if? Or do you want to be a 40-year-old guy sitting in California running Yahoo with me and saying, here's how we could change the world? And so I actually debated that for a while. <laughs> um, because, you know, I, I don't mind being a grandfather sitting on the front porch. And, um, but the attraction was everybody had... Uh, given up on the internet, right? I, at that point, ZDNet and CNET had merged. I was the president of CNET working with a great guy and a great friend, Shelby Bonney, who's just one of the great unsung, unknown uh, entrepreneurs. Um, he's now got a company called Whiskey Media, which is doing great. Um, and, uh, and this was the largest technology site in the world, and it was very exciting, but the market had collapsed. The stock had dropped. You know, we, we had to lay off uh, 800 people. So I mean, dropped from 100 bucks to... Four and a half bucks. Four and a half bucks. Yeah, that's why I went broke. Yeah. Yeah, that sucks. <laughs> Sell stock early um, is one of the lessons that I will impart with you today. <laughs> it, it's, it's like the, growing up, my, in my generation, the big thing was could you get 100,000 miles first in a year? And then you realize, what an idiot I am. Who the hell wants to travel that much? <laughs> um, it's, and so the early Internet people, it's like, I'll never sell a share. And 99% of the companies went to zero. Um, so think about that. But... Uh, but the, the, the reality was investors gave up, um, you know, VCs gave up, and lots of the early employees gave up. Um, but there were, some, there were some things that were just happening that just seemed so logical, which was the user base never gave up. At that point in time, Yahoo had 200 million users. There's only 300 million Americans. Broadband had, hadn't even really begun to start. Right, And you knew it was inevitable. You just didn't know when it was going to come or what format it was going to take. And thank goodness AT&T came along and had a $14.95 a month broadband. And suddenly the thing went from nobody having broadband to everybody having broadband. The email users kept climbing. The number of people using the site, the amount of time. And so my belief was the business model will inevitably follow where the users are spending their time. And so fewer people were watching television. Fewer people were listening to the radio. Significantly fewer people were reading magazines. Um, I predicted way back then pretty much the end of the newspaper um, because so many people use the newspaper for things that they were now using the Internet for, like going to a movie. My generation, you'd wait for the paper to come out and you'd look up time and location. Now it lives on your phone, right? It would never dawn on you to go to a newspaper to buy it, but that's what we all did on Thursdays and Fridays. And so you could just predict all the things that were going to happen. And, and so my view was if the users hadn't given up, that's the hardest thing to get. How do you get people to utilize what you're using? We could figure out a business model. Um, and so, uh, you know, Jerry called my wife, and my wife said, if he gets excited, we'll come out to California. We moved out here, and the rest is history. So I was there from 2002 to 2006, and, you know, we moved from 200 million users to half a billion. We moved from 700 million in revenue to 4.5 billion, and we moved from market cap of 8 billion to close to 30 billion at the time. And so uh, I, I consider myself one of the most fortunate people on the planet because 
I felt like the inevitable, always bet on the inevitable, and the inevitable was the internet was going to dominate all forms of communication, all forms of media. Um, I just couldn't predict how. But once you know that, you go all in. So a little company called Google came along. Yeah. And they competed with you guys in search, and by most accounts, Google won. Why? Does this tape get edited? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'd, I'd like to say they won the search business on the PC. It's yet to see who wins the search business in the mobile environment, and I think they and others are coming to grips with the fact that every time there's a, a form change, every time there's a device change, uh, things change. Mm -hmm. And good companies are successful in those environments, and great companies actually accelerate their growth in those environments. So, you know, Google, what Google did to Yahoo, it's now feeling from Apple and Facebook. Um, and every 10 years, it seems like these great companies hit a bump in the road. So about that time, Yahoo hit 10 years. Google has now hit 10 years. And, um, you know, I, I, it, what happened was we were many things to many people, and they were one great thing to everybody. And sometimes it's just what you believe in. It's how the question gets framed. So when I came to Yahoo, people were not interested in investing in search because there was no way to make money. Right. And then along came GoTo, which became Overture, which ultimately we acquired. And Google, <coughs> Google didn't care about making money. They cared about improving people's ability to search. And they were originally going to be enterprise. You know this. Enterprise search. And Yahoo was actually using their search engine. And then something happened. Somebody created a business model around search. And then to get around patents, Google improved on Overture's business model. The logic we had was you, you bid the most, you come up first. So the logic was it was sort of self-policing. Why would you bid the most to come up first if you weren't the most relevant? And Google figured something out that said it's not who bids the most. It's how you generate the greatest amount of value off each click. So it's a combination of location and price um, and click-through. And that, allowed them, that, ena that enabled them to make more money on every click than we did, which allowed them to invest uh, a lot more money in increased monetization engines um, and then buy distribution. They could buy distribution at um, you know, half the cost that we could or a third of the cost that we could. And so you know, here we were as a public company trying to balance multiple businesses, and they were focused on one, and they were making more money at every click, and they were able to run the tables successfully in search. Um, and... Uh, and you know, they, it was fascinating, which is we were the number two search engine in Europe with a grand total of 11% market share. So, um, so a lot of the business side um, the around the engineering of, of monetization really hurt us. Mm -hmm. um, now, the flip side is Yahoo is still doing incredibly well. It's got half a billion, 600 million users, something like that. Um, it's one of the three or four sites that everybody uses. It does phenomenally well in brand advertising. It's got the lar all the largest media sites. But the money was being made in performance-based search ads. And the, you know, the yield was ridiculous. You could, and the algorithms that they were able to write, and we were able to write, frankly, uh, understanding the network effect of these businesses, it's really a fascinating business model. And, and if anybody ever asked the question of me uh, that I always ask, which is why the hell do you have to learn math? Because everything you do in engineering and technology turns out it's all math, it's all math. Um, and um, so I need to go back to school. <laughs> yeah. So, so you mentioned buying Overture, and uh, I looked up on Wikipedia in your tenure, at, which is an absolute source of truth, in, <laughs> as edited by the people. In your tenure, like the at Yahoo, Facebook movie, <laughs> you bought twenty-eight companies, including Ink to Me, Overture, Flickr, Dialpad, Delicious. Uh, totally over $3 billion. So a lot of the students out here are thinking of starting companies. What do you look for when you're looking to make an acquisition of a company? Well, um, it depends on the stage company you're at. So at Chegg today, we've already acquired a company from Stanford, in fact, and Philip is right here and his team, uh, uh, CourseRank. Any of you guys use CourseRank? So <laughs> founded by uh, entrepreneurs right from your school who are now um, single and millionaires, um, <laughs> which I am neither. Um, so, um, so it depends on the stage company you're at. So in, in, when we were at Yahoo, we had determined that we could iterate but not invent. Because once you're a large company, um, 
you have operating metrics, once you're a public company, there are numbers that you need to make, and almost everybody you hire is about executing on what you need to do right then and there. And one of the big difficulties, you know, the, the, the dilemma that they talk about is the fact that it's very difficult to invent. So if you look at what Yahoo did, if you look at what Google's done, look how many companies Google has acquired over the last couple of years. Um, because you don't have the DNA in the company, things change in technology. So what we were looking for were things where we thought the fire hose of Yahoo could be a kingmaker. So if we could put our audience against something, we could make it big and we could run the table. And most of the acquisitions we made were extremely successful um, as a result of that. Sometimes we were buying things for a team, and sometimes we were buying things for technology. Um, and so you know, when we bought Flickr, how many of you use Flickr? So at the time that we bought Flickr, it had something like 600,000 users, and now it has 40 or 50 million, uh, maybe more than that. I think it left at 40 million. We knew that it was never going to be a business, but we knew it was going to be an unbelievably value utility for people where we could attract audience, bring them back, and benefit our core business model mm -hmm. at very low cost. And so we were willing to buy it. Uh, and the thing has been incredibly successful for Yahoo. So our business was advertising. People always ask, is Yahoo a media company or Yahoo is a technology company? We're, we were an advertising company. We made our money off advertising. And so we needed to attract eyeballs and get the highest value we could for each eyeball. And so we were looking for things that could fill in those gaps um, and create a reason for people to start their day and end their day with Yahoo. So there was a pretty big one that got away. There You're is. the only person who ever got Mark Zuckerberg to sign a letter to sell you his company for a billion dollars. How did you do that? And what happened? Clearly not as successfully as you just made it sound. <laughs> um, he signed the letter. He didn't actually end up doing it. You know, um, and Mark will tell you this, which is um, he was a reluctant seller from day one. And every great entrepreneur that I have ever met at one point in time feels like, wow, maybe I can't do it. So if you think about the history of Silicon Valley, like eBay almost sold several times to Yahoo. Yahoo almost sold for $2 million to AOL. AOL almost sold several times, including to Zip Davis back in the day when we were there. Um, almost everyone, Intuit almost sold to Microsoft. Just, you can just go through this day in and day out. Um, and so there's a moment in time where you say to yourself, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. Well, a billion dollars sounds like a lot of money. <laughs> um, and uh, I was very fortunate to meet Mark, and we had a, a, a very strange sort of uh, connection, which is a uh, number of his early employees were people that used to work for me and I remain friends with and uh, actually helped sign on to go over there. And then uh, both Mark and I were born in the same hometown um, several years apart. And if you don't think that six Just degrees of separation is weird, the guy who made the Facebook movie, Aaron Sorkin, and I graduated high school together. So ask yourself, which of those three is the loser in that crowd? Um, so uh, I get Chihuahua. <laughs> um, and so, and I love him. <laughs> um, so I, I spent a year getting to know Mark and getting to understand the business and working with him um, as frequently as he was willing to talk about it, his vision and his dream. And I got ridiculously inspired, to be frank with you. And it became more and more obvious to me that uh, what Facebook was going to be wasn't what it was. So I think I met Mark, there were 4 million users or something like that. And, um, you know, we kept modeling the company as if it was going to be 18 million users, which is pretty much 100% of college kids. And, um, and Mark just kept saying, it's not for college kids. It's just where it started. And so what became evident to me was the most successful companies on the Internet really are services. Email is a service. Search is a service. Travelocity, Expedia, um, just keep thinking about it. Chegg is a service. eBay is a service. Amazon's a service. Apple's a service, right? It's services. And so he had viewed Facebook not as a media company or not as any of those historical definitions, but more as a utility that everybody could use and that everybody at some point would want to be connected to somebody else. Now, did he know how he was going to do all that? No. Um, but he was very clear. And so I kept thinking, hmm, there are 6.5 billion people in the world, 300 million Americans, 
So the world's a very big place, much bigger than the United States. China was going to become the biggest Internet country in the world. They have more Internet users than we have citizens. So you can see all this happening. 50% of all new users were connecting through mobile devices. And that by the time my tenure was going to be done at Yahoo, over half the world was going to be connected to the Internet somehow. And so it just sort of felt right. And so I think because I was as excited about his vision, the stuff that he knew and the stuff that he did know as he was, I think he felt, and you'd have to ask him, that he could have confidence that somebody was just going to let him run with his dream. Um, and, you know, he was reluctant from day one, and I think uh, when we gave him the opportunity to not do the deal, I think he just cheered. Um, I think he was feeling pressure from his board, and, and at the end of the day, he turned out to be right. Um, I think it would have been transformative for us at Yahoo. I think um, we don't know the road not taken, so we don't know if, it would, if we would have messed it up or if it would have become even bigger. You'll never know. But... Um, but I feel very fortunate to have built that relationship and, and watching him build this dream is, is, now that I'm not at Yahoo, it's more exciting to see him build it there. Um, uh, but, um, but, you know, we'll never know. So but, now uh, you're running. But he, he want, what he wants me to tell you is what, when he said to me, Dan, would you really, if you were me, would you buy the company? And I was honest with him, which is I'm completely subjective. I want the company. I think it's transformative for Yahoo. And he said, what would you do? And I said, well, what I would do if I were you, is um, if I were 20 years old or 21 and someone offered me a billion dollars, I'd call my mom and say, Mom, somebody offered me a billion dollars. Should I take it? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't know if he ever did it, <laughs> but that was my best suggestion to him. <laughs> um, and, uh, and the rest is history. I mean, Facebook's one of the greatest things that we've ever seen. Truly. So but now you, you're But running. you were the guy who kept telling him not to. I, sell it. I told them not to sell it, and so you it turned out to be a good decision. <laughs> I, I was on the other side of that deal. Uh, so, so now you're running another college-based business, and uh, you, you were not the founder of the company, but you're, you're now the CEO. I remember the first time I met Chegg, I was just so compelled by the founders because I remember walking into Stanford Bookstore at the beginning of every quarter and walking out having spent more than half of my allowance for the quarter and just feeling like it was totally unjust. Um, obviously, you solve a big problem for college students, so they don't have to feel that way anymore. What, what is compelling to you and unique about Chegg? So on a, on a professional basis and uh, based on my family background and based on the things I'm passionate about, um, there are 18 million kids that go to school in higher education in this country. 14 million out of that 18 million are in some sort of financial aid. We subsidize. It's, it's United States is is almost education is treated as if it's a charity, right? Which is public education is paid for, and we know what happens with charities. They don't sustain themselves, and so you're watching now. The country's broke. The states are broke. The localities are broke. Every school. Um, I have a 17 and a 15 year old, so I'm going through the process. My daughter's a senior this year, and we're looking at colleges, and it becomes really evident the cost of college. 25 to 30 percent of the cost of college are the textbooks alone. And so just that my mom is a school teacher, 39 years, a public school teacher. Aunts and uncles were principals. Um, we grew up with my mom and my brother and I in a very small apartment in Dobbs Ferry where, where I said Mark and I were sort of both born. And it seems like this country has no ability to compete if, because we're such a small percentage of the world's population if we cannot educate people. And so that alone just pissed me off. Um, the opportunity to save hardworking kids and hardworking families, a lot of money. I mean, I, all kidding aside, and I realize we're at Stanford and I understand the cost of tuition, but I do know they subsidize families of, who earn less than $100,000. So I'm sure there are people here on financial aid of some sort, or you know people, your friends are on financial aid. But if, if, if somebody could save you two to $400 a quarter or a semester, is that a lot of money to you? Right? It, is, it is to my kids. Um, it is to most people that I know. I mean, you can't take for granted saving that amount of money for a kid. So what, what, what Chegg did um, was they hit a pain point. Most great entrepreneurial companies that have been created, in my opinion, and this is something I did not really understand um, until a couple of years ago in living out here, they're somebody solving a problem for themselves that turned out to be just a problem that a lot more people had. And so these guys, you know, particularly uh, Ayush, who's still at the company, um, the name Chegg came from the fact that it's in order to afford college, you need money. In order to, in order to get money, you need a job. 
It's like a chicken and egg situation. So, you know, this is a guy that came over from India in 2001 uh, to get his um, MBA at Iowa State, and he was doing everything he could to make money to be able to pay for his education. And so, you know, hence a company like Chegg is born, and he retooled the model, and, and the rest is history, at least at the moment, and we're still writing our future and our history. But um, the opportunity to build a company that has a real value proposition, the challenge of the digital transition that is coming and is going to come, uh, the opportunity to change the face of education and, and perhaps save, save you guys time, save you money, and help you get smarter, um, to be able to create environments in which you can get access to content that actually help you learn um, uh, the way you choose to learn is a very exciting opportunity. And, and so I, you know, some of my passions are... Uh, obviously, my family and music, which is why I went to Guitar Hero. And, um, but education has always been one. And going through this process, my wife and I going through this process with my daughter, it's just, it's, it sucks, right? It's very difficult. It's very painful. It's very expensive. You feel like the weight of the world's on your shoulders. Um, and if we can make the lives of students easier and the lives of their families easier, more affordable, I just feel like it's a great opportunity. And it's one of those rare opportunities where doing good happens to be a great business. We have, you know, we'll, we'll rent this year in excess of three plus million books. And this is a company that didn't exist three years ago. So it shows you that we've hit a pain point. So it sounds like Chegg is very mission driven. How do you build a culture in a company that's growing so quickly around that mission and get everybody signed up for it? Well, the first thing you do is you, you establish a vision for the company, you establish a mission, you write your company values. Those things, you know, people take for granted, and a lot of us, like myself, who joined a company. See, when I, when I came out of college, I needed a job. Uh, my mom was getting divorced for the second time, and we were going to have to sell the house, and I was going to have to get a job like everybody else. And, um, and I went into a company, and what, what you think is, who had the job before me? What did they do, and how can I do the job 10% better? And you move out here, and the questions are very different. The questions are, what needs to be done, and what's the smartest way to do it? And that, wow. I mean, when you reframe the question, you know, the question you asked me is, what did you not know then that you know now? To me, everything isn't so much the answer. It's how you frame the question. It's what problem are you solving for? How would you define success? Is that success big enough to matter? What are the assets you have? What are the assets you don't have, and can you get them? And if you can, what's the likelihood you're going to achieve that success? It's not a business model. It's are you thinking big enough? And so, you know, we've written our values where the first value is think big because this is the, just the textbook market alone. It's a $12 billion market. So I'm proud of where we've gotten to, but we're, we're a, a, a gnat, and, you know, out of the $12 billion. So you get people understanding a common vision, the definition of success, what their roles are, what you're going to reward at the company. And then you hire people who buy into that and are willing to be part of a team instead of, you know, Randy Moss having to leave a team every three years or Tara Owens having to leave a team every three years. These are individual performers who are the hardest people to fire because they're great individual performers but lousy character, right? And... You try to avoid as many of those as you can. You don't get sucked into the drug of somebody who can get you a short-term decision. And you build a team, and then you reward it, and you communicate and over-communicate. And these guys are, are all Chegsters here, and they'll tell you, we meet as a team, as a company, once a month. We go through the priorities. We, we define whether or not we did them well. We communicate them. We laminate them. We put on everybody's desk. Um, and the employees hold the management responsible rather than management holding the employees responsible because... If we, didn't, if we didn't focus the resources on what we said we were going to do, it's our fault, not their fault. And, and you get people fired up about it. And, um, and we have a company, if you walk in, the energy is extremely high. Um, we have people from all over the world. We have tons of young people because, you know, we don't want people who have too much experience to think that there's one way to do anything. Um, and then once you define success, people then know how to make a good or a bad decision, and you can give them the freedom to go make a decision. And, and another thing that I learned, which I didn't learn when I was a younger executive and manager, is it's better for the CEO to describe success than to prescribe how to get that success. Because I can do things the way I do things. We do things very different. So if I say to you, 
here's the mountain you need to climb and here's exactly the steps you need to take, but they're unnatural for you, you're not going to be successful. And that's one of the hardest things as an executive to do is get really talented people in the company, work with them to define success and give them the freedom to do it the way they're best suited to do it. And that was, that's an invaluable lesson for me. So earlier this year, Steve Jobs introduced this little thing called the iPad. And it's currently $499, but if you, know, you watch the history of the iPod, it's going to get to $99 soon. You're disrupting an industry which is print, print textbooks. But there's another disruption coming behind you. What do you think about the future of education? And Just to be clear, we're, we're not dis disrupting a print industry. We're disrupting a, a price point that seems unreasonable um, and would never hold if textbooks weren't required reading. This is one of the few markets where they are required reading. You can't get competition. We've introduced competition. We are taking the financial risk on your behalf. We are buying the books. We are calculating that we can turn them enough times and liquidate them at the right price and that you guys will send them back in the right condition. We are taking that risk. So what we, are, what we are beating up is an unfair, we believe should be unsustainable business model um, that is not in favor of the student. If print was around forever, I'd be thrilled. Then I wouldn't have this strategic issue to deal with. Um, so I, I just sort of want to make that clear. Um, but one of the things you also learn in life is bet on the inevitable. The reason I came to Yahoo is I bet on the inevitable. I bet on the Internet. I couldn't be sure Yahoo was going to be it, but I knew for sure somebody was going to dominate the Internet for a period of time. So we're betting on the inevitable that ultimately students will increasingly want digital assets that help them make their college lives easier. And we acquired course rank because if, if you go through the spectrum of you know, going to the College Board website, how many of you remember this, and you sign up for your SATs and ACTs and all the stuff that people at Stanford need to sign up for that I didn't even know existed, um, and then after that, you start to, um, you get your grades back, you do your test prep, then you get your grades back, you start to figure out what schools you might want to go to and whether those grades are good for those schools. And then after that, after you get into your school, you look at the financial aid sites. So, you know, the number one college site that people look at is the, is the financial aid sites. What does that tell you um, about the state of the country? So, but after that, after you get admitted, what's the first thing you need to do? You need to plan your classes. So along come these smart entrepreneurs who have calculated that there are 7,200 classes here at Stanford or something like that, and there are how many different ways to graduate your, to get your degree in CS? You still don't remember how many times have I asked this in terms of 6.7 times 10 to the 13. Okay, you could talk that way when I didn't own you. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, um, it's some crazy number that requires a calculator and extra toes and fingers. Um, but here's a kid who comes over from Poland and says, it's too hard. I want to know the following things. Just simple stuff. He was solving a problem for himself and his friends, which is, how many classes do I need to take? What's the cheapest way for me to get my degree in my major? Who, which professors are good? Which one's grade hard? <laughs> which one's grade easier? Can I want to read ratings on professors, and I want to rate the professors. And then on top of that, I want to know all my friends that are taking the class because maybe I don't want to go into a class with somebody who's super smart. Maybe I just want to go into a class with somebody who isn't. Or I don't like this person and I don't want to be in class. Um, or maybe I want to know somebody to go into a class where I know there'll be three tutors, right, um, that can help me. And so they built course rank, which most of you use. And so for us, the first thing we want to do is start to offer services that add value to you, that cost you nothing, that help our core business. So once we know who you are and what professors you're taking, what classes you're taking, and what your grades are, we can begin to help you understand what your required reading would be. And then on top of that, we can take the data of what else you've gotten and say this is suggested reading. So here's what people who took this course also got. And by the way, on average, they got an A. Wouldn't you be interested in knowing that course material that they used? So... The philosophy and the strategy is just keep building really valuable services along with you, students for students, if you will, network effect businesses. So course rank, when we, when we were happy enough to, um, to come together, we're, it was on 30 campuses. Now it's available on close to 200 campuses and will soon be available on over 1,000 campuses. 
And so imagine a scenario where we know students all over the country who've taken classes, who've rated professors, who've told us if, if material is good, and then what if we were able to provide things like class notes and tutors and, um, uh, and answers to questions? How valuable would stuff like that be for you? And what if we could make it available on every device? And so we plan to try to do all of that on behalf of the student, and that will drive our core business, whether it be print or whether it be digital. So we'll be able to help you by being valuable to you 300 days a year, not just two. Great. So I want to save some time for questions, but do a quick lightning round on, on a couple quick topics, so a few sentence answers. Um, a lot of the interesting president CEO people in Silicon Valley, LinkedIn, Groupon, uh, the president of Microsoft Online, all worked for you at Yahoo. What makes a great leader? Uh, receding hairline. <laughs> <laughs> I think some of them still have your, their hair. You know, I, I think um, what makes a great leader, and I'm particularly proud of, of the fact that, as you know, there are partners at Excel and, and, as you said, CEO of LinkedIn and president of Groupon and people running um, lots and lots of these companies and many of the people at Facebook that, that I've had the pleasure of working with over the years. And the consistent thing is their, is their value system, um, which is they want to think big. They're optimistic. Um, they recognize that everything is not perfect, but it's their job to solve it, not to whine about it. Um, that they surround themselves with people who are as smart, if not smarter. I mean, when I walked into Yahoo for the first time, it was probably the first time in my career where everybody in the room was substantially smarter than I was about almost everything. And that's a frightening thing. And so when you come out here and you meet really smart people like you, um, you realize that, that if you're in the technology industry and you're in an industry that's designed to change the world, um, you got to be willing to trust that people are going to figure it out over time. And so these leaders, what do they have in common? They execute. Um, they understand the value of technology. They recognize that at some point they do need to build a business out of it. They hire really talented people. They give those people the freedom to execute. Um, they course correct. They accept responsibility for their mistakes. I mean, for every success you see, the number of mistakes made are the ones that you don't see unless you're in the company. It's, it's unbelievable. I mean, a 300 batting average in baseball is higher than the batting average of the, of the quality of decisions. Um, and what they really do is they gather together a group of really talented people like we're doing at Chegg. And the, the CEO doesn't have to be the smartest person in the room. And that was something that I didn't understand. They just need to know who's the smartest person on that subject. The CEO doesn't have to act like the most important person in the room. Everybody knows. The CEO has to play their role, which is at the end of the, at the, end of the discussion, use their judgment to make the best decision and sell it through the organization. Right? Um, and so all of these people possess a lot of those things, plus they're honest and they're transparent and they like to win. They're competitive people. Um, and... It's hard to live in Silicon Valley and not be competitive. It's hard to go to Stanford and not be competitive. But the win is not you have to lose. The win is did they set goals big enough to achieve them? And along the way, some people will get caught in the wake. Does that make sense? Yep. So one last question before we take questions from the audience. Uh, a topic probably on the minds of a lot of people here. How does a recent grad get a great job? <laughs> Who's looking for work? <laughs> Nobody? Well, I got to go here. <laughs> Nobody needs financial aid, and they don't need jobs. Um, so how do you get a great job? Um, uh, first of all, probably the hardest thing to do is to recognize that um, you're not going to really know what a great job is. So the, uh, the advice that I would give you that I wish somebody had given me um, is the way you get a great job is you don't think of it as a job. Follow your passions. If you're excited about something, whatever you're doing is going to feel like a great job. So don't be afraid to follow your passions. Work for people or around people that you believe in and you trust, like I had with Bill Ziff, who we always thought is the mayor of Ziff Davis. We knew that what, if there were ever a big problem, he'd figure out how to solve it. Um, so follow your passion. Work for people you trust. Give everything you have to that. Define success. Never Never look back, meaning the road not taken is something you're never going to know. So make the road you're on successful. 
And as soon as you realize you can't be happy, go talk to the boss, make your case in private, and if you can't change their mind, go do something else because you don't want to be a cancer in an organization. It may turn out that you're wrong and they're right, or it may turn out neither of you is wrong or right. It just may not be the right environment for you. But you don't hang around in a place you can't find a way to be happy. But get up every day and recognize that, you know what, you're, you live in one of the greatest places on the planet. You're going to have opportunities that almost no one else in the world gets. Embrace it. Enjoy it. Do it with passion. And, and if it fails, do it again. Great. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Thanks, guys. And so uh, I'm going to, uh, uh, for Dan and Chi Wap, uh, how many of you uh, in the audience are in the Spirit of Entrepreneurship class, uh, MSNE 178? So as you can see, about a quarter of the attendees uh, are in the class that wraps around this one. And uh, good news for my class, for those of you who are smart enough to be in 178, Chi Wap and Dan will be joining us next door uh, immediately after uh, the end of this session. Um, so if my class could hold their questions and so we could get the rest of the audience uh, who will be registering next quarter for the 178 <laughs> class. Um, and uh, um, I, will, uh, I will just pick some, uh, uh, some questions. I will repeat the questions. And given my age and the number of neurons left, you have to make it short so I could remember it. Uh, so think about a question you'd like to ask that could be parsed in a complete sentence. So uh, questions, hands up. Who wants to ask questions? Come on. Right. Yes. Um, so what courses would you recommend that we take a course in the high-tech sector if we have electives? What you said like before that you didn't realize how math was so important until you until you did stuff in the schools. What courses would you recommend that we take? Great. So let me repeat the question. Uh, what courses besides MS and E one seventy eight and and the entire STVP program at Stanford in the engineering school that you'd have to attend, fly in from anywhere in the country and register for besides those classes? Uh, since you actually were a graduate of this program, it, that's that's to be serious. What, what did you think worked, and what do you wish now, truly, that not only you would have taken, but you uh, uh, students that you see as entrepreneurs should have taken? Yeah, so the, uh, the two best courses that I took here were E145, which is the Intro to Entrepreneurship class, and then the Mayfield Fellows Program, where I was a uh, Mayfield Fellow in 1999. The reason they're great is because they offer you a broad perspective on all the challenges that you're going to face over the course of an entrepreneurial career. And then from there, you can pick a jumping off point in which you dive in and you learn more. But I think it's really important to establish that baseline first, understand what it is that you're most interested and passionate about and what you're good at, and then go and do further coursework in each of those areas. But you, was there any technical class that you took or that you think you could So I was, a, I was an imaginary engineer, which they now call management science. Is that right? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> It, it, used, it used to be called industrial engineering, but we called it imaginary engineering um, because we used to imagine that we were engineers. Uh, but but as, a, as an IE, it actually is a fantastic curriculum because you take two levels of introductory coursework in each of the engineering areas, uh, electrical engineering, computer science, materials science, chemi. Uh, there was also a class called E60. I don't know what it is now that was uh, sort of more finance-oriented. But um, that collection of classes or that collection of coursework also gives you enough of an overview to then go deeper into the specific areas. I, I just want to state for the record two things. One, the names of your classes are harder than the classes that I took. <laughs> um, and, uh, and two, I don't think I've ever asked anybody what class they've ever taken um, or what grade they ever got. Um, uh, I, the questions I ask are, what are you excited about? What are you passionate about? What do you want from your life? And because if we can match what you want from your life with something at the company, you're going to work your ass off. And whatever you didn't learn here, you're going to learn it. Because people, the, the reason you do stuff you're passionate about is stuff you're not passionate about, just, you're never going to put in the time or the energy to understand it. it. You're just never going to be good at it. So take the classes that excite you. I don't think it's going to, I mean, maybe this is you know, something you shouldn't say at an institution like this, but I don't think it matters what class you took in terms of your ability to get a job. I think it matters your ability to articulate what you're great at 
and what you can add to a company, that will be the thing that gets you a job. Thanks. Next question. Right here. Um, so you said that some of the best companies are companies that see themselves as some kind of a service. But a lot of the companies like Apple and Google, they're not in the existence. So how do you, I think what I'm trying to ask is, how do you recognize what people need before you have these services in existence? So the, the, the question, if I understood it, was uh, uh, for the outside audience, uh, you mentioned uh, services, and the great companies were services, but how do you recognize what's a service, what's a need, and, and how, do, how do you know that? Uh, so the best advice that I got was from the founder of, uh, of RIM, BlackBerry. So when, when I... Um, when I was leaving Yahoo, he called me up and he wished me well because and, and, we had done a lot of great things together because I was very early in the mobile space because it became obvious to me that there were going to be more mobile devices. There were like a billion PCs and four billion cell phones already, so it became very obvious to me. So we were very early on working this way before the iPhone and any of that stuff, and BlackBerry the room was the first smartphone. And, and I said, so what do you think I should do? And he said... Um, I said, well, I don't know. You should probably take some time off, <laughs> which so I think was great advice. Um, but I said to him, tell me, what is it that you guys wish you were building that you think you wish somebody was building for the BlackBerry that nobody's built? And so we started to talk about that. And, and then he said, you know what, Dan? He said, let me give you this advice. He said, the challenge when you work at a big company like Yahoo is you keep thinking about things that 10 million users are going to use or 100 million users have to use right away. And... He said, when we, when we created BlackBerry, he said, we were trying to solve a problem that we had, which is we wanted to be able to get our email everywhere we were without having to boot up a laptop or even carry a laptop. And it took us five years to get 900,000 users, and then it took us five months to get the next 900,000 users. So rather than, rather than say, what is it, you know, what do I think the next huge idea is, is if do the things that you think you would really benefit from, that you're really passionate about, and then they grow into these giant things. Not, not, don't try to think, you know, I wonder what the next big thing is that I can make money on. It's much harder to do that, it seems. So when I look at, you know, Jerry and David didn't think, you know, what I want to do is build one of the biggest media companies on the Internet. Nobody knew the word Internet or media company on the Internet at the time. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I don't think Google thought initially that they were going to build, you know, the world's biggest advertising company. So you never know where these things, you have to be open to where they can go. Um, but I start with, what problem are you solving for? And if you solve it, what's the definition of success? And, um, and is that big enough to matter? And that's the way I would, I would think about it. And from the perspective of a venture investor, that's exactly what we looked at, too. Does the entrepreneur have a passion to solve that problem for themselves or someone that they really care about? Because when somebody walks in with a slide deck and says, I've looked at all these markets and this one was the biggest, so I picked it, they rarely are going to have a passion to make it through the ups and downs of a startup, of which there are many. Question over in the back. And so if I could understand the question in a, in a short old person's version, um, it was <laughs> why did you decide that, to crack no the business model uh, the way you did versus uh, via lobbying and legislation, et cetera? Did I, did I get yeah, That's so, the short version, so Dan the bitly version. That, I only have one comment as a more recent grad. You think you actually want to keep all your textbooks, but after trucking them all around for 10 years, which I did, I never opened those boxes. That's why Chag is such a good idea. And again, I still have my college textbooks that I didn't even open when I was in college. <laughs> <laughs> I just still got the wrapper. <laughs> Maybe you could so just sell I, the spines, right? <laughs> I, um, by the way, if my daughter's watching, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, 
So I, I'm going to answer your question uh, uh, honestly. Uh, I hope that's okay, which is, first of all, um, as good Samaritan as I'd like to be, um, introducing legislation doesn't make a business for me. Um, it may lower the prices for you. Um, and truthfully, we are working on trying to get legislation passed, and there was legislation passed a year ago that makes it a lot easier for businesses like ours to offer services like this. So that's a very difficult road to hoe. There's lots of special interest groups. Um, you would assume people would get up every morning and do what's in the best interest of, of the country and for the greater good, and then you realize that we're in America and that's not the way it works. Um, so that would, be, that would take forever um, and maybe not even be successful. So, and, and we can't make a business out of it. Now, the fact of the matter is uh, we do allow students, we don't expect to get 100% of the market. So there are books that we know that people would rather own than, um, than rent. Um, the vast majority of students don't want to own their books. I mean, when I say the vast majority, 90% don't want to own 90% of anything they've ever bought because they don't need it beyond it. People in the sciences or math or medical or law, sometimes they want to, or business, they want to keep some of these things, and they should. We didn't used to make that available through Chegg. We do now. So now there are certain books that if you want to own it, you can. We're likely to sell it to you used because we want to keep the prices down. Um, so you are actually able to keep your book and the cost of keeping it will probably be cheaper than through us than if you were to buy it used someplace else. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all the way in the back. You, you guys are a disruptor in the space. Have you talked to some of the establishment in your industry, like Fallout or some of the school bookstores? Yes. <laughs> right, so the question Do you was, want to know how those conversations went? <laughs> right, so, so, so the question was, um, is, is it possible that you've actually talked to some of the existing uh, book uh, vendors and suppliers? Yes, yeah, so we, we meet with the publishers regularly and have built a really great relationship with the publishers because what the, the vision that we sort of uh, articulated earlier is one where the publishers actually buy into, where there's a lot more material that they create that you don't even know exists that could actually help you do better. And so we are becoming a direct-to-consumer marketing environment on behalf of a lot of the publishers, and so they've embraced us. Um, the the bookstores, uh, uh, so there's the distributors that also have bookstores like Barnes & Noble and like Follett. Uh, we have been in uh, discussions with all of them, and we'll be in regular discussions with all of them. The rental model is really difficult to execute on. I mean, if you have any understanding of the investment that we've had to make in the algorithms and the technology and understanding the demand curve and when a book is going to fall out of favor and the warehousing, it's really a complex business more than it sounds. And we try to make that invisible to students because it's not your problem. It's ours. And so we, we are working with a number of them. Uh, MBS is a big wholesaler. We actually they have a site called textbooks.com. We offer Chegg Rental branded through textbooks.com in partnership with them. Um, we've had several meetings with Follett about whether or not, because Follett handles your bookstore right here at Stanford. Um, most of you don't know it because it has to be called Stanford Bookstore. So we're in constant discussions with them, but the reality is there's 8,000 college campuses. Follett's on 900 of them. Um, and most of them are not on the top 1,000 schools that, that represent 11.3 million of the students that go to school. So we, we track diligently everywhere that we have competitors, everywhere those competitors have launched a rental program. We track our penetration into each one of those schools and to see whether or not the penetration is higher in non-competitive schools. And so we, we feel very comfortable that we can execute on our business model as we're doing it today. But every opportunity we see to work with them, we'd like to. We have time for one last best question. Who has the best question here? <laughs> the best question is, we're really going to grade you here. Is this the best question? Best question. I grade on pass-fail. <laughs> you all pass. Uh, do you think the new Congress grant that encourages colleges to colleges and universities to encourage rental bookstores, uh, rental book, bookstores and programs in their own colleges, would that be a hindrance to check? Because, for example, if Stanford the bookstore opens a rental thing for Stanford students, Which it did. Sorry, the question can't be longer than the answer. So what's the, the, can, you shorten, can you shorten the question? I, I could summarize it for you, which is the, the, the United States uh, government has offered $10 million grants to bookstores to be able to set up their own rental programs um, to be able to lower the price of books to students. And I applaud anything the government does that helps students save money. Um, I, I really do. And, and if it's competitive to Chegg, so be it. Having said that, the intricacies, I think what the government missed, and actually feel very fortunate because uh, after this, having um, the, the CTO, 
of the United States. Uh, great guy, really smart guy who cares about everything you care about, including legislation. Um, uh, he vi visits Silicon Valley regularly, and we're meeting with him uh, tonight for dinner. Um, so, you know, they're part of all this. Unfortunately, I think that money is going to be poorly spent, and the reason is because one of the difficulties of a local bookstore doing it without somebody like Chegg is they rent you a book, then they get the book back, but if the professor doesn't reassign it, they're stuck with the book and half the revenue they used to get, and they can't return the book. And so my feeling is I'd rather have seen that money uh, go to something else to lower the cost of education than something like that, not because I work at Chegg, just because I don't think it's a sustainable effort. Um, and, um, and our growth has been spectacular, independent of all that. So we've been very fortunate. Thank you for the question.